Dr. Uh, it's a pleasure, Dr. Richard Rosenfeld is a, a IAPO board member for many years, and uh, we are together in uh, ISOM, International Society of Otitis Media. Richard Rosenfeld is uh, one of the most important researchers, and uh, he published several papers on otitis media, acute, uh, effusion, recurrent, tympanostomy tubes. He did uh, almost all the American mm -hmm. Academy guidelines uh, in this subject. Thank you so much, Richard. It's a pleasure for us to have you here. And uh, Dr. Uh, Koji, also from the Fundação Otorrino, is also with IAPO uh, joining us in this uh, webinar. Please, uh, uh, and also we have uh, Andrea Negreda, that is our uh, translator. And if you go down in the bottom of uh, your uh, screen, you'll see a little globe. You click the globe and immediately you could uh, have the translation and choose for Portuguese. I'm going to speak in Portuguese. Se você tentar ter a tradução, você poderá na parte de baixo do seu uh, screen, uh, justamente tem um globozinho, você clica nesse globo e aparece uh, português, e você uh, faz a tradução para o português. Então, temos tradução simultânea, and uh, please, Richard, uh, go ahead. It's a pleasure for us to hear you. Thank you, Tanya, and let me uh, start by acknowledging the incredible contributions of Tanya C, not just to Otitis Media as a president of ISOM, but also to YAPO and Pediatric ENT. I, I can't think of anyone who comes to mind who has had a greater influence or made a bigger impact in pediatric otolaryngology worldwide than Tanya. So it's a, it's a pleasure and honor to know you, Tanya, and work with you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, for those of you who know me, normally I would give this talk in, in Portuguese, but uh, there was somewhat short notice, so I hope you'll excuse me, and I'm going to uh, speak in English this time, but next time in Brazil, it will be in uh, Portuguese as usual. I've planned about 45 minutes for the presentation, and uh, I was asked to speak about really the new things, but uh, I want to put that in the context of controversies, so uh, I'll emphasize the new, but I think the controversies are also important. And, you know, I, I don't know about in Brazil, but certainly in the United States, we, we have quite a lot of Dr. Google. And by Dr. Google, that's those people who, who come in and uh, they're already experts by the time they see you. And uh, there's a nice mug you can get that, that says, don't confuse it with my medical degree, but for otitis media, at least, is there any sense of how good the information is? For a lot of conditions, it's pretty bad, and I'm sure that patients in Brazil around the world go on the web as much as they do in the U.S., and interestingly enough, a very new study looking at the quality of patient education on, on different platforms, and they used a validated instrument and looked at the family physicians, WebMD, Wikipedia, ENT Health, which is from the ENT Academy in the US, the American Academy of Pediatrics, et cetera. And surprisingly, they found that everything was pretty good quality. There were minimal shortcomings. The content was balanced. The readability was a bit tough. It was uh, up there, but uh, this surprised me. Uh, but I think the key is they're looking at reliable websites. So you look at the family physicians, some of these bigger internet sites, the otolaryngologists, the pediatricians, but clearly patients come in with a lot of knowledge and expectations. Uh, let me start with the first controversy, which I always begin with, uh, but I think it's worth emphasizing because diagnosis is always the key. And this really hasn't changed much. It did change from the original American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines, which emphasized the traditional verbiage of middle ear effusion with acute signs and symptoms of inflammation. Really now it, it, it basically is uh, a bulging eardrum. So really distinct bulging of the tympanic membrane is pathognomonic, is diagnostic for acute otitis media. 
perhaps a little lesser bulging with some suggestive signs or symptoms, but it's really that distinct bulging that is the key to diagnosis. Now, if you don't have it, it's unlikely to be acute otitis. And these are the same criteria that led to inclusion in the current clinical trials. I found this interesting, just, just published, uh, looking at a group of about 100 infants that came into an ENT practice with a primary or chief complaint of shaking their head, tugging, pulling, rubbing their ears, things that might suggest an ear problem. And of these, only 17%, so maybe about one in six had some middle ear fluid, otitis media with effusion. Uh, about half were normal and a bunch had some earwax. So not exactly highly suggestive of acute otitis, but you know, some did have effusion. And the ones who did have effusion tended to have a lot more uh, complaints in the daytime. And Normal exams often had ear tugging, which just leads me to believe that young children enjoy tugging their ears, that it's not necessarily an ear problem. And guess what? In those tugging groups where, uh, uh, where the ears were normal, there tended to be a lot of depression in the family. So maybe the, the parents were projecting their own issues on the kids. But bottom line is that, you know, ear symptoms, rubbing, tugging, pulling, uh, 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 touching have very poor relationship to uh, otitis media and, and should not be used in, in diagnosis. <clears throat> now we always get to this, you know, wh which children with a real diagnosis of acute otitis media, so you have that nice bulging eardrum, who can you observe? Um, and this is more important than ever with resistant uh, bacteria. The paradigm from American Academy of Pediatrics has not changed, uh, to my knowledge. And below six months of age, it's generally wise to prescribe. These kids are at risk for separative complications. Uh, in that intermediate category of six months to two years with bilateral acute or otorrhea, and in the children a bit older with otorrhea, antibiotics do have a significant benefit in systematic reviews, particularly individual patient meta-analyses. Doesn't mean that you must prescribe, but you'll get a lot of benefit from antibiotic in these groups. It's a little less clear as you start to get to the older children with unilateral, um, and even the intermediate children, six to 24 months with unilateral. So there's a lot of leeway to observe unilateral acute in any child older than six months. And even the bilateral in an older child, um, uh, I would certainly be inclined to observe. So if we flip it around and say, who should get antibiotics? If you have otorrhea, there does seem to be a benefit. Very young children below six months and bilateral acute in the child six months to two years of age. The severity, it's important to remember, it's not how much bulging there is of the eardrum. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty classic bulging drum with pus behind it, acute otitis media, very high certainty of diagnosis. But what would make us call it severe is the level of otalgia. If there was an elevated fever temperature above 39 centigrade, and persistent otalgia for at least two days without improvement. At least in the AAP guidance, that would make it a severe acute otitis. It is definitely not the degree of bulging. And if any or, or all of those things are present, generally best to prescribe an antibiotic. Um, a lot of kids with these features are excluded from some of the trials. So if you've got the more severe or persistent case, that's not the best kids for uh, observation. <clears throat> so why care about this stuff? Why not just give everybody antibiotics? Well, the, the thing we think about from a global perspective is resistance, but you know, from the, the child perspective, there's a lot of adverse events. This just came out, a systematic review, looking at 82 randomized trials for acute otitis. And what they found is diarrhea is, is fairly common, particularly with the moxclav, 19%, or ceftonir, 13%. Those are 
fairly high numbers, so almost one in five with amoxicillin clavulanate. And the next thing would be the rashes, whether it's generalized diaper rash or a candida rash, uh, particularly with amoxicillin or amoxicillin clavulanate. Uh, the diaper rash, for example, is about one in six or one in seven children with amoxclav, about one in 10 with ceftonir, and even the candida rash is uh, about one in 16 with amoxicillin. So a definite downside there. But do people care? I mean, what's going on now? Um, th there's constant studies coming out about whether people are prescribing or not. Here's one from Denver in the U.S. looking at uh, a thousand acute otitis media visits in children's two or older, presumably who would be very amenable to an observation approach, yet 98% of them received an antibiotic. 98%, 4.5% had the so-called safety net prescription, which says I'm giving you the prescription, but hold off for a couple of days, two or three days. If you're not getting better, then begin it. I mean, this is terrible. Uh, it's almost routine prescribing in these older children. And not only that, more than half they gave for 10 days or longer. Uh, in this age group, as we'll see, really five days is sufficient. And the ones who are most likely to get these long courses were in the emergent um, uh, urgent care settings. I'm not sure about outside the US, but I tend to see some of the worst medicine practiced in these urgent care, 24 hour, after hour settings where you know, everybody comes out with an antibiotic, a nasal steroid, uh, Singulair, um, everything under the sun. I mean, they're prescribing mills and the diagnostic accuracy is terrible. So if you do prescribe, what's best and for how long? Uh, the guidance from AAP going back a few years was for amoxicillin or amoxclavulanate. If you'll notice, it's for high dose, 80 to 90 mg per kilo. Uh, I think if you're in an area with pretty universal Prevnar, you know, conjugate pneumococcal vaccine, that's not necessary. You could use standard dose of 40 milligrams per kilo. And you'll notice that entity of otitis conjunctivitis, which is when a child presents with an ipsilateral acute otitis media and conjunctivitis. This tends to be almost always caused by non-typable haemophilus influenza, about 40% of which produces beta-lactamase. So if you are seeing a child with otitis conjunctivitis, best to go with amoxicillin clavulanate to cover the beta-lactamase producing bugs. There are some alternatives uh, for penicillin allergy, ceftonir, cefuroxime, cefpodoxime, or intramuscular ceftriaxone. And there's very little cross-reactivity with penicillin. So even in the face of a history of anaphylaxis or a type 1 penicillin reaction, you can give these third-generation cephalosporins. That is current uh, thinking. The cross-reactivity is almost uh, uh, zero. So these are good options. Again, what's going on in practice? Study from this year looking at... Um, 2,360 roughly visits in a, in, a, in a study network. And what did they find? All right, 83% of acute otitis got an antibiotic. Uh, I guess that's better than the 98% in the other study, but it's still high. Most of these were for greater than seven days. And even in children five or older, more than 90% are getting oral antibiotics. At least two thirds of them with a recommended antibiotic. And just to put this in some context, if, if you look at other studies done in the past, observational studies where they use a watchful waiting approach or delayed prescribing, typically about 65 to 70% of the uh, patients um, uh, uh, are suitable for some form of delayed prescribing. So to be giving antibiotics uh, to 83 or 98% of visits is, is clearly excessive. They even treated pharyngitis here with antibiotics, uh, even when cultures were negative. So again, very poor uh, urgent care and ED practice that we're seeing in the United States. Uh, another one here from Italy, 
last year, looking at a big outpatient database, what's happening in Italy with prescribing for acute otitis media. Well, there again, 83% are getting antibiotics, still up there. And um, two thirds of the pharyngitis, many with negative cultures, clearly bad practice. And they're using more uh, amoxicillin, amoxicillin clavulanate. The duration of therapy, I, I mentioned in a couple of the recent studies that they've been giving for um, uh, more than five days and often 10 days or longer. Uh, the current recommendations are if it's a particularly severe infection or a very young child, do the full 10 days. In the kids who are in the preschool range, seven is probably sufficient and above age five, it's five or fewer. And as we saw in, in those studies, even the older children were getting 10 days of antibiotic. You will minimize side effects and resistance by minimizing the duration. So really in, in most children, five days is probably sufficient, even in the younger ones, um, uh, but especially in the older ones. There is one good systematic review on this from a few years ago clearly showing that even in the younger kids, there was no difference. So my preference is, um, uh, even though I'm an author of BAP guidelines, I tend to use short term for almost every child, unless it's a very severe infection. Age to me is not a big criterion. And even uh, just to extend this a little bit, you know, for group A strep, pneumonias, urinary infections, again, there's, there's not a lot of evidence to say that we really need those seven to 10 day courses. Five days are usually sufficient. <clears throat> so you've diagnosed properly, you've treated, given the right antibiotic, uh, or at least a watchful waiting. Uh, if the patient isn't getting better, what do you do? That would be a treatment failure. Typically, a lack of improvement with whatever the initial approach was within 72 hours. It's not uncommon for the kids to worsen a little bit in the first 24 hours, and we see this in randomized trials even when antibiotics are prescribed. But you know, within two to three days, they should be improving significantly. If they're not, that would be a treatment failure, which could be caused by a few things. I believe most commonly, it's the typical viral bacterial coexistent infection. You know, just think about it. The child comes in with a high fever and an acute otitis and you give the antibiotic, the fever in large part is most likely due to the viral infection. And that's gonna take a couple of days to reduce and would obviously not be impacted by the antibiotic. Uh, less commonly, it, it's a resistance issue and sometimes it's misdiagnosis. What's going on with resistance? A very recent systematic review uh, looking at a host of middle ear aspirates to look for trends in resistance. And what they found is uh, about two thirds of the aspirates were positive culture, most commonly pneumococcus, followed by non typable haemophilus and Moraxella cataralis. Um, in many studies now, you're seeing more homophilus non-typable because a lot of the, the, the pneumococcus, the bad bugs are being covered by Prevnar, uh, which was not in place at the early end of, of this particular systematic review. But what I found fascinating, you know, at least in these studies, 85% of the isolates could be treated from a bacteriologic standpoint with amoxicillin. And that's huge. And you might say, well, amoxiclav is better. It gives you that 10%. But, but don't forget that the natural history of acute otitis is great. And even in placebo-controlled studies, about 80, 85% of these kids feel better in a few days. So when you combine this natural history with this 85% this for amoxicillin, it really is a great first choice. Um, and again, I wouldn't give the, the high dose always. I think a standard dose is fine. Amoxiclav is fine too, particularly if you've got otitis conjunctivitis. Erythromycin is not a good choice. And interestingly, they didn't find a trend in time, although I, I think the current data are showing a bit more non-typable um, H flu than in the past. The antibiotics recommended for these treatment failures tend to be amoxiclav or ceftriaxone. Again, AAP is very fond of this high dose uh, product. 
And there are alternatives, including tympanocentesis. Uh, I do see some occasional treatment failures in kids, not as many as in the past due to the uh, Prevnar, but when they come in, they're impressive. And, and they've got a big bulging eardrum. They've been on one or several antibiotics. Here's an example of, of a, a young girl who had several shots of IM ceftriaxone or recephin. And you look in the ears and it's, it's like nothing was done. Both, both drums are bulging, there's purulent fluid. So the AAP guideline says this is a good child for tympanocentesis, which for many, many years, I'd say even decades, I did tympanocentesis or even a myringotomy in these children. And I found that almost universally, this type of child would be coming back to me a month later with fluid, and then they'd go on to need tubes for either recurrent acute or persistent fluid. So it, it really, other than getting them over the, the initial hump, this, um, or the initial uh, severity of the infection, this tympanocentesis and myringotomy really didn't, in, in, from what I saw, accomplish much. So my, my, my thought was to put tubes in, and those of you who know me, I, I do a fair amount of office insertion of tubes, and this began a little more than 10 years ago. I first published on it in 2015, and you'll see on the left there what we call a papoose board, a Velcro device to keep the kids snuggled up so they don't move suddenly if you're gonna do this in the office. And in this study, um, we had very good initial results compared to the operating room and didn't seem like anybody was getting traumatized. The parents liked it, so I kept doing it. And uh, an issue came up last year in the US from the Food and Drug Administration as to whether it was even appropriate at all to do these tubes in the office setting. And the pressure behind this was from a couple of device manufacturers of automated tube insertion devices who were looking to get approval in office settings and the FDA came out and said, well, hey, is this even appropriate? So it reached out to the American Academy of Otolaryngology for a position statement, um, which read like this, that it began by saying, yes, tubes are safe and effective if you follow our guidelines. And then importantly, although it's generally done in the OR, the operating room under general anesthesia, putting them in in the office or clinic in, in appropriate patients uh, is okay. And there, there are some studies to show that, that this is fine. There haven't been complications. So since I published that article. Um, uh, this is a robust aspect of my practice. I, I do you know, anywhere from two to four per week in the office, so anywhere 100 to 200 per year, sometimes more. And uh, I've done probably about 400 now. Most are young. They come from all over the place, including international, to avoid the general anesthesia. It's quick, about four minutes. And Initially, I did this in very young children. I extended it. Now I'll basically do it in any child of any age if they're willing to get into a papoose board, that device with the straps. Now, why is that? Because I've just had too many experiences where you think you have an extremely cooperative seven-year-old child, and the second you do anything that bothers them, they get crazy on you and they start having a tantrum or moving their head, et cetera, and you have to abort. So. Uh, as long as they're willing to get into the, the papoose board, and I will use topical phenol typically for anesthesia in, in everybody except the very young children, uh, I can do this. And it's very rare for me not to be able to do it. I do uh, T-tubes, long-term tubes. I've done stenotic canals. I, I've done pretty much everybody in the office at this point. And uh, we have it down to about three, four minutes if there's no um, uh, difficulties or issues with the canal or, you know, a lot of oozing bleeding, but it, it, at least for me, this is really a big part of my practice and uh, has been particularly helpful during COVID because it didn't require general anesthesia. We could do it in the office. So uh, it's something to think about. Here's just a picture of one of these little uh, papoose boards. We don't call this restraint, we call it protective stabilization. Uh, 
protective stabilization because you are stabilizing the child for their protection. And an assistant will gently hold the head. I'll get the microscope in place and do this. And the parents will be in the room. And uh, um, it, it tends to be universally appreciated uh, by the families. More people are doing this now. There are a few companies making the tubes. This just came out in Laryngoscope. It's from a, uh, a company called Tusker Medical, which makes not only an insertion device with a proprietary tube shown here, but they also have an anesthetic system. They call it experience management. It's a resuscitation of the old iontophoresis, where you put some lidocaine solution in the canal, a probe goes in there for about 10 minutes and that creates an electrical current that allows the uh, solution to penetrate the eardrum and give you very good anesthesia. Uh, where on earth they found 222 children willing to sit with lidocaine and a probe in their ear with electrical current running through it for 10 minutes is beyond my wildest comprehension, but apparently they did. I love in their uh, details of their methods, they say they excluded everybody with behavioral intolerance. And they don't say how many people that is. So what that means is they excluded everybody who wouldn't sit still for 10 minutes with a probe and lidocaine in their ear. So, uh, you know, the generalizability here is questionable in my mind. They, they were successful in most cases, at least in these kids, 88%. That's still not fabulous in my mind. My success rate is much higher with plain old papoose board and typical devices. And 96% were very satisfied. There, there's at least two other companies uh, making insertion devices. One in the US, one is based in Ireland. Uh, and the main issue, in my opinion, with these is even if the device works well, they're all proprietary tubes. And we really don't know much about the duration of patency, the extrusion time, the otorrhea rates, any intrusion rates falling into the middle ear, early extrusion. So there's a lot of question marks here, uh, which is why I prefer to use plain old Armstrong beveled fluoroplastic tubes when I do this. <coughs> or a standard uh, T-tube, a modified Richards T-tube. Uh, uh, I'm not a fan of these proprietary tubes, at least not now. So uh, that was the, the treatment failures, but there are some uh, frequent flyers, the kids with recurrent acute otitis who, who come in for tubes. And we discussed this uh, uh, pretty robustly in our tube guideline that was published in 2013. We are actively updating this now. So that is going on. It's been a, delayed a little bit by COVID, but I'm sharing that again and where we've assembled the group, we're reviewing the literature and, and there's a lot of new and interesting things out there. But at least for now, this is the, the current version. And we did talk about recurrent acute and a typical child might be this. I see them all the time in my office. They're referred to me specifically by a primary care doctor because enough is enough, please put in the tubes. You know, and the child had a lot of episodes, but when I check them in the office, there's no effusion. The ears look pretty healthy, but they're frustrated. The parents want tubes and the pediatrician wants tubes. And I will tell you, I say no, I say no. And that's what the guideline says. If there's no residual effusion, the odds of tubes being helpful are very low. And as we say here, you really shouldn't do this if there's not persistent effusion. The reason being these kids have a good prognosis based on cohort studies, particularly of the old antibiotic prophylaxis on some other uh, observational research. Uh, kids who are able to clear effusion, even if it's not for an extended period of time, they usually do well. You could always reassess. On the other hand, the ones who have recurrent acute, that would be three and six months or four in the past year with at least one recent, they, they can benefit from tubes and it's perfectly reasonable to offer them that as an option to control the recurrent acute. I was very happy when this came out because it's, it's really the first study to sort of look at this recommendation and see, gee, is it, is, does it really play out in practice and is it a good thing? So they really assess the watchful waiting recommendation. 
And what they found was if they followed it and held off on the tubes in the kids who had recurrent acute but no effusions, about two thirds of them never needed tubes. About a third came back, continued to have troubles and got the tubes eventually, but you know, this is great. So you're really able to um, avoid tubes in a lot of these kids just by following this one simple rule, but uh, you wanna monitor them and you want the families to know that if the children continue to have trouble, simply come back. And if you begin to see persistent effusion, you can change the uh, plan and offer the tubes. So they felt it's appropriate and I would agree. Uh, we are seeing more vaccination, universal vaccination of either the 13 valent or other varieties of this. And I thought this study was interesting because it, it actually compared the new version, the 13 valent versus the seven. Um, and they found that even just this switch to the 13 valent uh, uh, eliminated about uh, a quarter, 24% of tube insertions. So uh, with vaccination, we're clearly seeing a lot less recurrent acute in tubes. The impact on otitis media per se is not as big. It's six to 8% in most studies, but uh, recurrent acute and tubes does seem to be having an impact. So vaccination is, uh, is important. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about middle ear effusion now. And uh, if you do have effusion, there are lots of choices of topical nasal steroids. I know they're used commonly in the US and in a lot of these urgent care centers. So which is the, the best one to use? Well, as you might have imagined, it was somewhat of a trick question. The best study for this is not recent. It's an older one, but I love this study for a reason coming up shortly. And, and they looked at all sorts of outcome measures and the nasal steroid spray versus placebo had no impact on resolution. So they concluded it was ineffective. There's been at least one other study concluding the same thing. But what, what I just love about this study and, and what will never cease to amaze me is how all the caregivers were positive they were getting the active treatment. Because even with placebo, you see, uh, after a few months, uh, more than half were better, uh, even in a month, almost half were better. And then as you stretched it out to nine months, about two thirds. So they all felt that no matter what they were getting, it had to be the real drug because they were doing so well. But in fact, it was uh, just natural history that was working here, not the drug. So in the uh, otitis media with effusion guideline, there's a series of recommendations against medical therapy for otitis media with effusion, including intranasal steroids, systemic steroids, oral antibiotics, and any histamines, decongestants. None of these have efficacy in treating it. All they do is have uh, side effects. So really no role for medical management of otitis media with effusion, either conventional or non-conventional, it simply does not work. And uh, I, I, you know, I think you have to always keep in mind this nocebo concept that not only are these things of no benefit, uh, but they all have side effects. So you get no benefit, but side effects and particularly anti-reflux drugs uh, have a lot of issues with C. difficile, with uh, bone fractures, uh, with hip fractures, spine fractures, um, uh, diarrhea. So please, please, please do not use these for otitis media with effusion. It, it is bad medicine and it just delays treatment and causes side effects. So that's depressing. If the medications are not effective, what else can we do besides, you know, put in tubes? Are there other options? And Certainly the most promising is the autoinflation uh, of the eustachian tube, which if I'm gonna do this, I prefer the least expensive method, which is the autovent, uh, you know, piloted by Sven Erik Stangerup from Denmark. It's a great little device. If they're three or four years old, they can usually do it, where you blow up the balloon with your nose and it, it generates a, a positive pressure in the nasopharynx uh, to help open the eustachian tube. You know, the question is, does it really work? Um, are we just amusing the patient while nature cures disease, like the uh, study with the 
uh, intranasal steroids, or are you actually accomplishing something? The best trial on this is a few years old. It was unblinded. It's difficult to, difficult to do blinding with, with this type of thing, but uh, in the usual care group, we see this. In the group that had the otovent, we see the bars are higher. And uh, there was some of these were statistically significant. And uh, by three months of age in particular, you had about a 37% higher success rate um, by child, 41% by year. So there does seem to be some benefit. The confidence intervals on this approach one for the odds ratio, 1.03, 1.05. So we really can't exclude trivial effects, but given how inexpensive, harmless, and potentially effective this is. I, I prefer this if I'm gonna watch and wait and you know the family really feels they need to do something. Now there is a nice fancy version of autoinflation, which was uh, um, invented by uh, Dr. Badarian Maniri. And uh, it's a very cute little frog that has a anesthetic mask attached to it and by, you put that over the child's mouth and nose, and by squeezing the belly, you generate a pressure. So uh, you can use this on very young children, unlike the Otovent, which requires the child to be typically three or four by the time they can figure out how to blow the nose and inflate the balloon. He has some data on this to show some improvement in middle ear pressure. Um, you know, I can't say this is a robust study, but it does seem to show some potential benefit. So this is uh, devices available uh, from him and in certain countries. And it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting uh, twist on the autoinflation uh, concept. And autoinflation, of course, is based on the eustachian tube. And we, we know from Charlie Bluestone that in children, the eustachian tube is too short, too floppy, too horizontal, it doesn't work. It doesn't protect the middle ear from the nasopharynx, and that's why young kids get otitis media. And as they grow up a bit, typically by age seven or eight, the tube is less short, more stiff, less horizontal, and it seems to work better, so they get uh, better. Uh, this I just happened to see came out in 2020 in Journal of Laryngology Otology, and they're talking about balloon dil dilatation, decongestants, and novel approaches for middle ear fluid. Uh, balloon dilatation, by the way, in children has no role. There are some people doing it. It's pretty lucrative. People make money doing it. But the concept of truly dilating the eustachian tube in children is questionable at best, and the evidence is non-existent. Even in adults, it's, um, it, it's, it's a little debatable. But I love this, this paper because the, the, they say in this paper that it refers to, quote, an inspirational duo of lectures by Dr. Poe, who is a, an expert in balloon dilatation. He actually has been paid for this and, and has a, a bit of a conflict in the past. And they said that a paper surprisingly showed that topical nasal decongestants do not impact eustachian tube function. Well, it's been about 20 years that we've known this to be the case from systematic reviews that topical nasal decongestants have no impact on otitis media with effusion. So I'm not sure what's so new here, but uh, it was an interesting uh, thing that I tripped over. This is also interesting, thinking about Neanderthals. And this is somebody in my uh, uh, institution, SUNY Downstate, looked at eustachian tubes in the Neanderthal skulls. That's supposed to be skulls, not skills. And here's what they found. The human newborn has this horizontal, floppy, large eustachian tube, which is very similar to a Neanderthal adult. Floppy, much more horizontal than the typical human adults. And uh, they hypothesized that the early extinction of the Neanderthals was quite likely due to very bad otitis media, because like human newborns, their eustachian tube did not protect them from um, infection passing from the nose to the middle ear. And of course, there were no antibiotics then, so you had separative complications, and uh, it could be a deadly disease. But, you know, a fascinating uh, 
thing. So uh, one more reason to equate human newborns with Neanderthal adults. If you happen to be doing that in the past, I don't know. Uh, adenoids, that, that's a topic that comes up and I will tell you in the new guideline on tubes, we're gonna be putting a lot of effort into this adjuvant adenoidectomy issue. Uh, there's a little bit in the prior guideline and uh, basically it says that, you know, here are the indications for the tubes. Let me see, is this, ah, here's what I wanted. Sorry for the delay. So um, for adenoidectomy, there's an excellent individual patient meta-analysis that showed below age four years, there does not seem to be an independent benefit of adenoidectomy on otitis media with effusion. So really as a primary indication below age four, do not do adenoidectomy. Now, if the child has nasal obstruction, sleep apnea, chronic sinusitis, chronic adenoiditis, if there's another reason to think about the adenoids, fine. But I wouldn't do it primarily for acute, oti for acute or even otitis media with effusion below age four. You know, age four and above, there is a benefit. Um, it's somewhat small, but it does carry on beyond the tubes. So something to think about. I used to do a lot more adenoidectomies for um, uh, otitis media in kids over age four. I, I can't say I've, I've seen, at least anecdotally in my practice, the big benefits. So again, unless there are other reasons to do adenoidectomy, I'm just going to stick to the tubes alone, especially since I do them in the office almost all the time these days, as uh, previously noted. The last uh, controversy I wanted to mention is, is this swimming um, and water exposure while tubes are in place. And for a while, there's been evidence that you don't need to do this, but I've often heard when I, I travel to Brazil or other countries with, with a lot of swimming that, well, that really doesn't apply to us because our kids swim and you know we have a lot more problems. Uh, so we do have some new evidence here, and this uh, is João Suchel from uh, Portuguese, from Portugal, uh, where he looked at kids with uh, water precautions, a randomized trial. And if you look at the ones having at least one episode with the water precautions, we can see it's about a third and, you know, some get it with a, with a viral upper respiratory infection. And it's essentially the same uh, when you uh, just look at the kids who did nothing. So, uh, water precautions, headbands, earplugs are not going to prevent otorrhea uh, either due to water exposure or a viral upper respiratory infection. It, it, it doesn't work. Uh, more so, and it was not significant in any of these instances. You know, more specifically, we could go to Brazil, to Sao Paulo, where Marcel Miyake did this great trial recently. Um, 80 Brazilian children randomized to tubes, uh, who had tubes, they either had a protection or no protection. And the protection in this case was a little cotton with Vaseline and, or, or an earplug or a bathing cap. Uh, they did ask the, gr the, the groups to be a little careful with water exposure. And they had a calendar for 13 months. And what happened here? You know, the protection group had about 0.11 episode per month. So not very much in the first month. And then it dropped to almost minimal uh, in months two to 13. If you look at the control group, we see that in the first month, there was a little bit of a, a benefit. They, they eliminated about 0.2 episodes. So in that first month, if you use protection and five children did it, we'd eliminate one episode. In my opinion, probably not worth it. And then as you went on past the month, um, uh, it disappeared. So I guess if you can't help yourself and really must use water precautions, do it for a month after tubes and then stop. But uh, my preference is not to do it. There are some occasional children who get frequent otitis um, uh, with tubes and otorrhea, and we could always give them uh, water precautions at that time. So that uh, hopefully uh, has spurred some uh, thinking and debate, and I think it's time for questions. So I see Tanya has reemerged on the video, which means it's, it's probably time. So uh, 
uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any uh, uh, questions or, or comments. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, you gave really uh, 45 minutes of presentation, and we have uh, the 15 uh, minutes left for questions. But I would like to, to raise some uh, comments and applause for what you did on otitis media with effusion about uh, not giving medicines like uh, decongestants, uh, antihistamines, and especially uh, steroids. Uh, because that's a habit that we have in this part of the world, uh, to give uh, steroids for kids uh, uh, with otitis media with effusion. Uh, meanwhile, we are waiting to put the, the ear tubes. And right now you made a question, raised a, a comment about uh, uh, nasal decongestant also, that this gentleman pool uh, was, I, I was not aware of this, so nothing worked uh, in terms of medicine uh, for otitis media with effusion. I'd like very much to, to compliment on, because you raised this uh, comment in a very proper way. Thank you. Uh, other, um, uh, Koji, do you want to, maybe you could do a ping pong? I already make a comment, do you want to do another comment? Yes, yes. Fisher's a uh, very good presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to ask you about the, do you recommend a temporary use of hearing aids in these patients that you are waiting for the tubes? Uh, I'm sorry, Koji, temporary use of what? Hearing aids. Oh, hearing aids. Yes. Okay. So if there is a hearing loss. Um, so I, I personally have not. In England, in the United Kingdom, they use a lot of hearing aids for otitis media with effusion, uh, particularly in Down syndrome children, where they tend to feel there, there's more otorrhea and perforations. Um, there's been some studies. Uh, uh, the children don't often uh, enjoy using hearing aids or comply with it, but I suppose if there's going to be a significant delay in doing it, then a hearing aid would be fine. You know, again, in my practice for probably 80 to 90% of the tubes I do now, I just do them in the office. So there's very little delay in my practice, but if there will be a substantive delay, then a hearing aid is something that could be tried uh, if it's acceptable to the family and, um, you know, the cost is not prohibitive, I suppose. No harm would come from it. So Richard, I would like very much to make a consideration. Uh, I was trained in um, otitis media, especially in station tube dysfunction in Kyoto University in Japan many years ago with Professor Honju. And in uh, Japan, they use this iontophoresis. It was the first time in my life I saw in order to promote a kind of uh, local anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And they also, uh, like you, put ear tubes in their office, in their, in the, uh, their office in the university, in the hospital, um, like you do, but they use Yonto first. So that was the first time many years ago that I've heard about someone uh, placing uh, tympanostomy tubes in the office. Then you do yours in your office with the papoose uh, uh, device. Uh, we don't do this and uh, we don't have this Japanese um, also, um, way of considering uh, iontophoresis or even the papoose, it's not like uh, our culture in the Latinos, we are like kind of protective uh, uh, and they will not do this. But this is our opinion and we, it is different opinions of yours and the Japanese as well. They use this kind of uh, approach. Well, so that's uh, and about uh, adenoidectomy. There is a, a question here. Do you recommend adenoidectomy in a case of? Uh, I have had some uh, copper for in a case of what? Okay. Do you recommend adenoidectomy in case of snoring and uh, otitis media and on uh, recurrent otitis media? If you uh, it, regardless the age, even right. the, the, the child is below four years old. Do you recommend adenoidectomy 
if the child is uh, snoring and has, for instance, recurrent otitis media? So I, I think it depends on what is meant by snoring. If it's primary snoring where the child just makes some noise and often it's seasonal, it's a little worse in the winter and better in the spring, uh, uh, I, I would wait. That's gonna probably resolve as the child grows. If it's real sleep disordered breathing with the gasping, choking, irregular breathing, um, uh, and particularly with some daytime manifestation, the child is hyperactive or maybe can't focus or concentrate in school, then, then adenoidectomy makes sense. But uh, for snoring alone, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily do it routinely. I, I think it has to have some impact on the child's quality of life, either daytime functioning, cognitive functioning, you know, sleep, et cetera, to really be of value. Koji, do you want to do a question? Or maybe I, I yeah, would like yeah, to- Yeah, there's a question from Dr. Mauricio Kurki here. He's asking about the post-tube uh, otorrhea if uh, you use antibiotics in recurrent recurrent uh, otorrhea? So uh, there's the immediate post-operative period, about 30 days, where you can have some drainage, um, typically due to the pre-existing disease. But let's assume we're talking about uh, acute tympanostomy tube otorrhea after 30 days, which can either occur as a primary otitis or, or perhaps due to some water penetration. So uh, a lot of that is self-limited, so I would uh, give it a chance for a few days to see if it goes away on its own. And people can use a tissue spear, take the end of a tissue, twist it, pull off a centimeter on the tip and use that to blot the, the otorrhea. That's what they do in Australia with the Aborigines. Uh, if it's persistent or bothersome, the treatment is topical antibiotic drops, something that's not ototoxic such as a quinolone, ofloxacin, ciprofloxacin. It could be the eye drops, could be the ear drops. And usually that will resolve it quickly. And interestingly, the, the Dutch study in New England Journal from Ann Schilder's group um, showed that you don't even have to clean the ear, that even without oral toilet, without cleaning the ear, there's tremendous efficacy of, of topical drops. If it's extremely refractory, goes on for a week or two or three, then I would use a, a wick, a compressed cellulose wick, and, and put that in there for a few days up to a week and use that with the drops. But uh, you can almost always resolve it with topical. The only other thing I would say on that is even if it's resistant, like methicillin resistant Staph aureus, it still is going to respond to the quinolone drops because the concentration is so high that, and, and quinolones, uh, uh, their, their killing is dependent upon concentration. You don't need oral antibiotics, even for something that's resistant based on a serum minimum inhibitory concentration. So topical drops almost always. So uh, Richard, uh, a kind of take home message for the pediatricians that are with us this evening. Uh, for otitis media with effusion that we call otite media serosa or secretora, uh, if after three months uh, you're uh, watching, waiting, and uh, trying to see uh, the, the tympanometry result and if the child doesn't make better, and if the child doesn't have, uh, for instance, any risk factor like uh, uh, cleft or, or autism or, uh, visual impairment or something like that, uh, you decide to put uh, ear, uh, ear tubes, the tympanostomy tubes. I think that uh, that's a, a wise thing to do uh, when you're uh, waiting. Uh, and the, the, the ear tubes, the tympanostomy tubes, are the final uh, message for otitis media with effusion when you follow up the kids at least for three months and have this in, uh, impact on hearing. Is that uh, your opinion? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, uh, after, what happens is after three months, 
the likelihood of spontaneous resolution becomes very low. And even if you wait another six months, it's maybe 25%, 30%. So it, it, it's not optimal. Um, so after three months, we've eliminated the transient effusions after acute otitis or the new onset, and we're left with the real thing. And then as you noted, it depends on the hearing level. So we wanna get an audiogram if possible, um, but you don't have to have audiometric hearing loss. You, you use the right word there, Tanya, which is hearing difficulties. There are some children who even with normal hearing have a lot of difficulty in classroom settings with background noise when there are distractions in groups. And now with everybody with a mask over their face with COVID is gonna create more hearing difficulties. So, um, you know, if there's a question about a child and their ability to hear and process what they're hearing and it's chronic, don't mess around. You, you put in the tubes, you wanna give this child the benefit of the doubt to, to develop uh, to their full potential. So I, I agree completely. And uh, also uh, the high concentration of um, amoxicillin clavulinate that's uh, 80 to 90 milligrams per, per kilo. Uh, we, uh, we used to hear very seldom because we have around 10% of pneumococcal intermediate uh, resistance here. And I've heard that the United States after 10% uh, MIC of uh, 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 four in te, uh, over 10% uh, of the American kids, you use the uh, double concentration of amoxicillin clavulanate. Is that your first uh, uh, choice when you have a, a child that uh, received uh, antibiotic the last uh, one or two months? Uh not necessarily, you're absolutely right that the only benefit of the higher dose amoxicillin is for the intermediate resistant pneumococcus. It's not going to get the highly resistant. And uh, the thinking used to be if they had recent antibiotics or if they were in daycare or group care, they were more likely to have this. I, I don't think that's ever been shown. And certainly now with almost universal a conjugate pneumococcal vaccine, the, the pneumococcus is not as problematic as it used to be in the past. So I, I'm not a big fan of sort of routinely or reflexively given the high dose amoxicillin. It does have more side effects and more resistance. Um, but in selected children who, who have not responded well to amoxicillin in the past, or if you know in the community there are problems, I, I think there's a role for it. I, I just don't do it routinely anymore. Okay, thank you, Richard. As uh, do you want to to make an, another question? Because we have only three minutes left, and I promised. Because Rich has another uh, webinar at uh, uh, in three minutes. Do you want uh, Koji have another question? Uh, just a question. Yeah. Just one uh, final question. It's about the, the, the last uh, uh, presentation, uh, the Dr. Julie. Huh? Do you believe in diet, di diet factors of involved in otitis media? Oh, is that Julie Way talking about milk and cookie disease? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm a big believer in, in, what's called lifestyle medicine, eating right, exercising, sleep, all these things. And personally, I'm a uh, vegano. I eat a whole food plant-based uh, diet. Uh, the only food that has really been shown to influence the middle ear is if someone has a milk protein allergy. So a definite milk protein allergy can cause some middle ear inflammation. I know Julie speaks about a lot of sugar that that might have adverse effects in dairy products. You know, it, it's pretty anecdotal and I'll always hear, you know, oh, take the child off dairy for three months before doing the tubes. And what I'll say to that is, you know, if 50 million people say a foolish thing, it's still a foolish thing. So, you know, just because someone says, well, you know, take them off, I, I don't believe that. I think kids should eat healthy, but if they really need tubes, and have bad ear disease, they should get tubes. 
the diet, in my experience, is not going to, to solve that problem unless it's an unrecognized milk protein allergy that you can then you know, treat. But that's just my opinion. 